Satema, what's up, brother? Glad to have you on the podcast. Ryan, it's an honor. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I caught you on uh, on vacation in, in actually my home state of, of Utah. Are you in northern Utah or southern Utah? Uh, or Utah County, right around uh, BYU. Right on. Yeah, yeah. I I uh, moved out here to Maine three and a half years ago, but we were in southern Utah in St. George area. Nice, man. Did you grow up in Utah? I did. Utah's home for me. I uh, went to high school here, went to BYU, been here most of my life. So this is still home, even though we were in California for six years. We've been in Florida for uh, just over a year and a half. It seems like there is a a growing Samoan population in Utah. Is that accurate? Um, there are so many Samoans, Tongans, Hawaiians. What, what is it about places. Utah? I'll tell you, it's, uh, you know, like one in, I think one in four, one in five Polynesians are like uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So they just, they, they gather where there are other members of the church, of that church, and they just, once they populate an area, they all move there, and here we are. I mean, I used to want be Polynesian out here, and I go to places now, I don't know any of the Polynesians anymore. There's so many, so here we are. Hey, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Well, man, it's good to have you on the podcast. I, I know that we've we've been connected for years at this point, and I'm a huge follower of what you do. I think above and beyond what I see you do in the professional space and how you're motivating and inspiring others. I'm always motivated, inspired mostly by your, your family posts. I got to say, it's pretty cool to be able to see that and how you talk a lot about that. Cause we see what I see is a lot of influencers talking a lot about the business aspect of life, which is good, but, but fewer talking about the family side, which I think is crucial. Well, I appreciate that. I, it, I feel the same way about you. I, I love seeing your boys, your young men who are turning into men, their weightlifting meets, hunting, um, out in the snow. It's fun. And I'm like you, man. Like We're cut from the same cloth. There's no success outside of the home that will ever compensate for failure in our marriage or with our children. So that's a natural part of living. And it's, it's one of the best. You know, I'm here on vacation. I got to take my boys to the gym every day. And we train every day on vacation we they got to read 10 to 15 pages every day and i just i love being a family man and i, I appreciate your example as well you've been brother you have been a light a beacon of light in this space not just um personal development but for for men for women for for young men and young women so thank you so much man i really appreciate your example thank you thank you that means a lot i it's it's interesting you know, when you, you pay those compliments and, and I, and I accept them to the degree that I can, but I know where I fall short all the time. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't deserve any of that. Like I have so much work to do on myself. Uh, it's hard because we put ourselves in these positions where we want to serve and we want to help. And I think sometimes people might interpret it as we're, we're, we're better than we really are, or that we belong on some pedestal that we don't. And I never want to place myself on that pedestal because I know where I fall short. I'm with you, man. I, I think I apologize to my boys a handful of times a week. I'm like, man, I'm sorry. I'm like, it's okay, dad. I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I just, I need to be more soft, more patient. That's one of my biggest focuses this new year is just really being patient and having just greater love, you know, because yeah, I'm, I'm in my forties and my boys are still, they're young teenagers and not even a teenager, my youngest. And I'm like you, man, like every night and every morning, I feel like God whispers to me, like you can be better as a dad, your youth, that was too much. And as much as I, I strive for greatness and, and business, I, I really feel like the voice whispering to me like you, you need to stop doing this or you need to start doing this and it always is with my family so i just listen to that voice and and uh always win if we do how uh you have how many boys do you you have two boys three boys a three 16 boys. year old a 13 year old and a 10 year old and they are very very different like they're so different yeah. Yeah. I know all about it. I've got three boys as well. I also have a little girl. A lot of people don't know. I also have a daughter because I don't post a lot about anything with her by design. Obviously as a dad, I think we, we are generally more protective of our daughters than, than we would be our sons. Uh, but yeah, I know about the personality differences. I'm curious when you, when you're talking about being on vacation in Florida and 
uh, having them read, you know, pages of a book each day and having them train each day on vacation. Is, are they like normal kids where they push up back against that? Are they all on board with that? I mean, it's, I, I, it's nope. hard to get my kids on board with some of these things at times, even though we talk about it and do it all the time. They're on board most of the time. And, you know, once you set the standard as a parent for us, I just said, look, this is the law. I'm like, it's like gravity. We don't touch any electronics until we hit a, a workout, till the chores are done, until you read at least 10 pages and read your scriptures. Like I, In the beginning, it was just like they fought against it. But the more, as you know, you, the more you teach your children the consequences of, you know, the positive consequences of, of being smart, of working hard, of having vision, of being well-versed. My boys, most mostly right now, they're they're good with it. There are days when they're tired. Like yesterday, my son didn't want to go to the gym. And it took me about 10 minutes. He's just like, I don't want to go. I'm tired. Excuse, excuse. I said, son, you're going to feel better. You know it. And I know you're tired laying here. So I had to use influence and persuasion and consequences. And just I, I just talked to him. And he got up. And once we got to the gym, he's like, Dad, thanks so much. Thank you. I, I needed this. And I came home from the gym this morning. And they were both literally reading. They're like, almost done, Dad. I'm like, good. So, yeah, they're like, nice. they're normal kids. There's days where they don't want to do it. But overall, you keep pushing, teaching, 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 and you hope and pray that it lands in their heart and they accept it. Do you ever feel like you you push too hard on them to excel, to, uh, you know, to, to read, to learn all this stuff, to apply all this, and, and, it, and it maybe hinders some of their – their innocence or their childhood, something like that. And Ryan, all the time, I'm every day. I mean this. When I go to bed at night, I'm you know I'm praying to God, and I'm like, man, Lord, I need some help. Like, my just, I'm my standards just so high for myself that I feel like I'm. There's days where I do I feel like I'm too much, and then I talk with my wife, and then there's days where she's like, you're fine, like. It's okay, and and I, it's one of those things. Parenting, it's like it's like start a business and grow a business, and raise children inside and have a, have a family. And I, I I can't even say that I'm perfect. That I, there are days when I feel like I'm too much, and then I back off. And then there's days where I'm like, ah, I think I need to push. I, I can't accept this and tolerate this behavior. So a work in progress, Ryan. Total work in progress. Yeah. So it sounds like your wife is a big part of helping you to see things differently than maybe you would without her. Uh, yep. Is Are there other facets of your life that allow you to see things in a different perspective that isn't that hard charging, you know, life coach type personality? Yeah. You know, I, I the Polynesian culture, like Samoan culture, Polynesian culture, very happy. Like we're not, Samoans are known as the happy people of Polynesia. So they you know, being at peace and just being okay, just call slowing down, it helps balance me because I am a, the majority of the time it is like, I'm like, hey, let's go short, hey, boys, time, let's go, we got to be, and I'm just like, let's go. And then there's times where I'm like, dude, Emma, and, and my wife helps me to see it. I have some of my, my mentors and my, my team at work, they're like, you'll never get these days back, man. Like, and, uh, like you'll never get them back. So just, it's okay if your boys sleep in. It's okay if the house is a mess. And I'm like, you're right. You're right. Like, it's okay if my boys are not perfect 24-7. So I got great people on my team to help balance me out. So I'm just not always treating it like we're going after a state championship or a national championship or a Super Bowl. So I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot different than that uh, that island time, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's like island culture in our family where we just super chill. chill. And I and I'm remember I'm teaching my boys. Hey, look, we sh we, we're early. If we're on time. We are. And they're like, we're late. So we we're early. We're early. We show up. We dress up. Like we do what we're supposed to do. We want to be leaders in the community and instruments in God's hands. And I just love being a dad. I mean, I like you said, I, I fall short. And I course correct and I audible and I adapt and I adjust. And that's one of the best things about my life is my boys and my wife and our family. When, uh, so you have this hard, you know, hard charging attitude. I think, you know, if someone were to go visit your website or just listen to you on your podcast or even here, they're going to get that. They're going to gather that. Is that, yeah. is that something that you've 
developed over time? Is that, is that ingrained into you by your folks like, or through sports, which obviously was a huge component of your life? Where, where does this come from? I'd say uh, really like three places. Number one, my parents never pushed me hard. There was nine kids. They worked graveyards, sweet shit. They worked everything, right? They came from the island. So I'm the first generation here. So just seeing them work and grind and provide, like they, and I would say often, like, I don't know how my parents did it. Like, how did they do it? Like, they just did it. Number two, sports, like football, basketball. I played football. And you, you get into systems, right? You get around someone like Lavelle Edwards, or who passed away, BYU's coach, Bill Belichick, into the Patriot system. You just, mm -hmm. to become great, the top, it requires a special kind of hunger, a special, um, this commitment. And then, you know, from my parents to sports. And the other one is uh, this God. I really, the more that I, for me, the, you know, I, I use the word God and I worship God. And I tell people, look, you don't have to worship who, who I worship. But the more you study about the character of God, you just realize, like, he's like, whatever you want, you can go get it if you'll pay the price. You know, plant the garden, plant the seeds. Water, nourish, and take care of them. You know, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So, Rob, in Polynesian culture, and then football has helped me to develop into a very hungry, very committed man with high standards who really strives to live a awesome, awesome full out life. Yeah, man, I I, I feel the same way with a lot of those uh, factors that you're talking about. Obviously, God, um, sports was was a big part of my life when I was younger. You know, never never played in college or professionally, but that was a huge, huge component uh, of my life in getting my butt in gear, realizing that there's other people who are going to be impacted by the decisions, positive and negative that you're making. So man, that was a huge part of my life as well. What? Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I, I love being around athletes because athletes understand this component of winning, of losing, of paying the price, of facing adversity. And I, I, I do, I see life through the lens of, I wanna go win. And, I, and, and win not like, I'm gonna step on people together. Win for us is an acronym that stands for what's important now. Like what's important right now? And I'm on vacation, so I've had to learn, I have to learn how to unplug decompress, reset, you know, just chill. Cause like I'm itching to get back to go to work. And my team is like, Satima, like be with your family, relax, right? It's okay. So I love sports. I love, you know, again, I'm an early rise kind of guy. Naturally, I'm a 430, get up early, hit the gym, meditate. The things that I do in the morning, morning routine. And there's days where I want my sons to do that. And there's days that they do. And there's days where they just all got to be kids and they sleep in and relax and hang out. So this is, it's a good balance for me in my life. How do you, uh, how do you square an activity like this where you're on this podcast with me, you're on vacation, but also you're kind of working right now. So yeah. how do you square that up? And then what, what do you do to explain that to your family? Like how, how does that work? And what does that conversation look like with your wife and kids when you're on vacation? I love it. So my, my family knows like, um, I'm the boss, right? I'm the owner of the business. I'm the creator of the business. So I make sure when I am with them, I'm with them. Mm -hmm. Going away as present as I can be. Um, this is, I have two hours of work today. That's it. I got a call with you. Then I have a, another call with a, a client. And then the rest of the day, it's like, we've been working. We've already been to the gym. What do you have breakfast as a family? Uh, we're going to go watch a couple basketball games tonight. So for me, it's just... A lot of people talk about managing expectations, and in our language, we, we don't live in expectations. We live inside of agreements. So we inside of a agreements. what? Agreements. 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 Got it. Yeah, you know, it's one of our principles, like agreements, not expectations. And so we just have agreements. Like, look, if we're at the dinner table, we put our phones away, and Dad's not going to be working unless there's something urgent. And you know, mornings mornings are my time. My wife goes and does her thing in the mornings. I take my boys to go work out in the afternoon. But what I've learned on vacation is be on vacation unless there's some urgent. And man, when, when I get an opportunity to speak with you, I'm like, man, I'll take it. My wife's like, cool. I know you listen to that guy's podcast. I'm like, I do. I read his books. <laughs> I listen to his podcast. I follow his stuff. So 
just having powerful conversations and very clear agreements makes things a lot smoother for people. I like that, that reframe of agreements, because I think what a lot of people do is they have agreements in their head about the way somebody else is supposed to perform. Like the way, but the way that your wife is supposed to act around you or the, how she's supposed to respond to what you're going through or, a, or a, an agreement in your own head about how your children are to behave. It seems like too often we fail to communicate the agreement that we have with them. So then it becomes what I've heard of as a covert contract. So we expect this person to behave this way and they don't because they don't know what you're thinking. And then we get upset because they're not doing what we in our own mind and fail to communicate what we think they should be doing. It's, it's, it's a wild thing that we do. It, it doesn't work, man. And you know, that's like an expectation. It's where, you know, I remember getting married and I was like, Hey, my wife's going to wake up. She's going to make me breakfast and she's going to do all these things for me. <laughs> I remember waking up and she's like sound asleep. I'm like, what's going on? And I didn't have the skills and the courage to just have a conversation. So I began because of the expectations, making up all kinds of stories. Like my wife doesn't love me. What in the world's going on here? And all of a sudden you have a conversation or you collide, you confront, and we just create very clear agreements or agreements for us between two people or two or more parties. You have these just clear conversations. And my boys had, but my boys know that the agreements are kind of our values and our, our core values inside of our family. So what I've learned is that people actually, like like you talked about, not these covert agreements or covert like things. It's just like, look, have a clear conversation. Make sure everyone knows who's doing what, by when, by how, and who's going to finish it. It makes family life and business life so much more smooth. There's less suffering. There's less misery. There's less anger because everyone knows, dude, here's the clear agreement. And you got to do this by this time. And if you do it, we're great. Right. What You talked about your core family values. What are, what are some of those values that you guys adhere to? And then how do you practice those values in, in real life? Yeah, look, for us, like love is huge, right? Just love, love, respect, having like soft. And when I say soft, I don't mean weak conversations, but I grew up in a home where like, we just would yell. And I didn't like that. And I don't like that. And it comes out when you start to see it, when I start to see one of my boys sound like me when I'm yelling, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're learning this for me. Mm -hmm. So love, respect, listening support right some basic things and then we talk about it if you whatever you talk about the most in your home in your marriage like just constantly teaching re repetition repetition you'd be amazed that like that becomes a language and i have a number of things right that you could have anything in life if you pay the price winners never quit quitters never win cleanliness is next to godliness like my boys can recite these things like because we've been saying them since they were like as far back as I can remember. So talking about what matters most, talking about future vision, talking about what really works in life. And again, I for my boys, again, I, we talk about money a lot. I show them my bank accounts. I show them my investments. And like in the beginning, they were like, whoa. Now they're like, I'm like, that's normal. Like these numbers are normal. In fact, we're not even wealthy. And they're like, we're not. I'm like, no. So I'm starting to create real like reality of like, there's a standard of how we live. There's a standard of what it means to be a Mali. And, and one of the words we use in our family is champs versus chumps. I'm like, look, that's chump right there. Don't, don't do that thing. That's a chump behavior. He's going to lose in life. He's going to, he's not going to win. He's going to be miserable. He's not going to be healthy. So a lot of conversation around Winning and losing, the Lord's way versus the world's way, champs versus chumps. And it's just cost like you, brother. It's constant teaching, constant reminders, cleaning things up when we don't get it, when, when I make a mistake or if they make a mistake. And, and then I think the biggest thing is just learning how to speak in normal tones. Because I I just, I, I've yelled a lot. You know, it's like, I'm just like, force it. I'm like, dude, just, it's not what I want. I don't want to be that man who just has to yell. So calm conversations, clear conversations, love, respect, listening. And I'm like a lot of, you know, I believe that we're like a lot of the great families out there. We're striving. We have faith that it's going to work if we just keep teaching them the right things. Yeah. Yeah. I, man, there's so much to break down right there. I, it, it was interesting when you were talking about 
showing them money. My, my mom would be open about money, but not, not so open that we knew everything that was going on. And I think probably because money was pretty tight for us when we were growing up. Uh, but I had an interesting experience the other day. We were in the convenience store and I needed to get some cash for a basketball game or something we we're going to go to. And, uh, me and my two oldest boys went to the ATM machine and there was a receipt. And one of my bo boys pulled out the receipt from the previous person and look, and it had the bank account, the number on there. Yeah. And he looked at it. He didn't think anything of it. So then I withdrew our 40 bucks or whatever it was. And the receipt came out. He's like, can I see your receipt? I'm like, yeah, take a look. And he took a look and he saw the discrepancy between the two. He's like, whoa, you know, like we're rich. I said, no, we're not. We're not rich. I mean, compared to this individual who was before, maybe you could make that argument, but it's all about the actions that I've taken. That's the only difference between that number that you see on my slip versus what you see on that person's slip is the actions that I've taken. And so it's, it's pretty cool to be able to coach them and, and share with them in, in real time. And I love what you said about uh, what it means to be a Nali. That right there is so cool. My kids, we have little mantras that we use to my daughter and I were, uh, we were cooking dinner the other night. We made this bruschetta and, uh, I knew, I knew my boys weren't going to want to try it. And she knew her brothers weren't going to want to try it. And so we all sat down at the table and she's so proud that she made this. And they are like, no, I don't want that. And she says, Mickler, try, Mickler's try new things. <laughs> and that's the mantra. That's a mantra. That's something that we talk about all the time. And she's quoted it verbatim without my prompting. It's pretty cool to be able to see them pick up on that stuff. I love that, man. It's what it means to be a liquor, what it means to be a Nali. And, you know, Nali's are not afraid to do hard things. And we're champ and we serve and we hold doors open. And I really believe, man, if you, you take a great father and mother out of the home, like you destroy nations but you allow moms and dads to be in a great marriage and then be in a great home that's how you save nations it's in the family it's in the home because then you got instead of relying on someone else out there to raise your kids like i'm raising my kids i know it takes a village so between the good podcast and our church community our sports community my business partners and their families i love the village that that's helping raise my kids and i am like as much as I coach clients and people, with that much time, you know, so many stuff. So I just, I just feel like that's my duty, it's my obligation, but it's also my desire to raise strong, powerful men who know how to treat their wife, who know how to provide and like earn, and then who know how to like take care of other people and build like real, real wealth, real legacy. And so I love, I love that as a dad, man. I love it. How do you, when, so when you say champs versus chumps, I, I know what you're saying, but I think when people hear that, that could be a little off-putting, right? Um, yeah. Especially with a, a faith-based background, you might think that's judgmental. So how do you square that up with your children? Uh, not to be necessarily judgmental, not to, not yeah. to pass that burden onto other people, but to look at it objectively, because it is an objective analysis. Uh, and like, well, how do you balance that? Yep. So again, we always go back to love and I'm like, look, you know, Jesus loves us and we're supposed to love people. And I'm like, but you, you don't have to love someone's lifestyle and someone's consequences. They have their choices. And I'm like, if you, if you have a choice, would you choose this lifestyle or this lifestyle? And they're always like, oh, I, this one, I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. I go, we love people. We never want to like, and I, and the way I do it is I just ask if someone has this kind of lifestyle or they have this piercings or they drink or do drugs or whatever things like that's not our like what we do are they bad and they're like no i'm like they're they're good people they just have choices and a different set of beliefs so we don't have to judge them and put them down our job is to look at ourselves in the mirror and like am i better today am i getting better as a human being one of our again mantras is Every day in every way, we're getting better and better. Now, I, I can say every day in every way, my boys are like, get better and better. Mm. And, you know, that's the biggest thing. It's just like, love people, but we we got work to do. Like, And I constantly, my boys' ears, God didn't put you on this planet to be average, boys. He didn't put you here to just get by. Like, we, we have a special calling. We have a special mission. And like, whether or not... And people can say, well, how do you know? I'm like, well, because I'm making, I'm making it up for them. I'm creating this vision so my boys know 
this is how a man does it. This is how Anali does it. And we are champs. We are leaders. We are disciples of Christ. Like we'll fight against evil all day long. And I'm telling my boys, ain't nothing wrong with fighting. Like, you got to learn how to fight for the right things and put your foot down. And you know, again, I, I, you know, some people might call me crazy, especially with them, like a Christian background. But I'm like, look, we can, we can obey all the rules of the land. Uh, we'll obey most of the rules. I ain't gonna obey all the rules. You guys got that? And like, yeah, I'm like, there are some rules out there that are just hmm. I need you to learn how to listen to God. I need you to learn how to listen to your heart and soul. Then I need you to make great choices. And if you make a choice that doesn't work, then back up, clean it up. Don't guilt yourself, don't shame yourself, and keep moving forward, boys. Just keep moving forward because the world is gonna guilt you and beat you up enough. Yeah, that's that is true. You know, even if I because I I I don't know if you know or not, but I uh have recently disclosed and shared some, shared some of my struggles with alcoholism. And, you know, it's like, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your, how real you are about everything you post. Like you, you are, that's why you're one of the guys I follow. You're real, Ryan. You're real about the struggles you had. You're real about the, the weaknesses you have. You're real about what you feel and the work you put in. It's not always just perfect, perfect, perfect. So I, I very appreciate that, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's a challenge, you know, because that goes back to people putting you on a pedestal. And I thought, as I explained this to people, you know, it was going to reflect poorly on me. And certainly it does, it does reflect poorly on me, but I thought there would be, you know, backlash and pushback. And you know what? There wasn't any of that because everybody knows they have their own struggles. And I think we're tired of seeing people who uh, present themselves as perfect, like no issues whatsoever. Cause I'll tell you what, the guys that follow us, that te they tend to, and I imagine this is the case with you too, tend to fall into this comparison trap. And if they see these perfect people on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and all these other places, where does that leave them when they're intimately familiar with all of the things they fall short on? You know, Ryan, I, I'm, I'm the most real with my clients. Like when I'm struggling, like we, I just did a podcast that was like how to overcome the holiday funk. We had a Monday call every week and I, I get on, I'm like, I've been in darkness. I've been feeling the funk. I've been feeling lazy. I've been eating crumble cookies a dozen at a time and bluebell <laughs> ice cream. And I've been staying up late till four in the morning, watching things on Netflix. I'm, I'm so out of my routine because it's, I'm on vacation. And everyone's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do any work. You think I want to yeah. get in and do anything? I'm going to stay home and feel sorry for myself. So being real, right? Just telling the truth and, and knowing how to be real and knowing how to make it relevant and being okay, being raw, right? Real and raw and relevant. It allows people to connect because I am far from perfect and I have a lot of weaknesses and I have a lot of desires. So I just I have one foot in front of the other and I'm okay with people knowing I struggle too. I, I'm human too. Yeah. I like, I like that you talked about moving forward. Don't guilt yourself. Don't shame yourself. I, you know, I disagree a little bit. I think, I think we experience those emotions like guilt and shame and remorse and sorrow for a reason. I think those things are good. Those are telling us, Hey, you're not doing what you should be doing. You need to correct yes. your behavior. But I think too often we tend to attach our identity to it. Like, hey, I lost or I failed or I messed this up. I messed my marriage up. I do this. I do that. And and then we attach our identity to it. Like, I'll give you an example. It, it So I've been going to uh, meetings to, to help with my sobriety. And, you know, they introduce themselves as alcoholics. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Like, if that's the first thing you're saying, you know, like, I'm so-and-so, I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to attach my identity to that. Like, yeah, I, I, I recognize that I'm susceptible to alcohol. I recognize that I can make poor choices around alcohol, but I don't want to attach my identity to it. I don't want that to become me. Like I'm more and bigger and more important and better than that. That's just an issue that I need to address. Now, you know, I've never, never struggled with alcohol, but I have struggled with things that have plagued me, been like a thorn in my flesh and language for me is a big deal and again i've got close close friends that are a part of that it, it, it's helped them for me man i am are some of the most powerful words because whatever follows becomes the identity and whatever our identity is our identity is that's how we perform 
And so again, my boys had, we had these mantras, we call them conscious self-creation. I am a divine king full of love and light. I create my life. I'm 100% responsible. I'm 100% committed. And, you know, I, I'm with you, man. Like guilt and shame, they, there's a purpose. But most people, they sit in guilt and shame while that ship just goes down and down. And it's so hard for people to recover from. I'm I'm one of them. I used to guilt and shame myself, like just like a hammer. I just beat myself up. And one day, one of my mentors is like, you believe in Jesus, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, so why don't you just believe Jesus? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you beat yourself up so much. Guilt, shame, guilt, shame, guilt, shame. He's like, to the point where you bloody yourself while there's another path that allows you to be like, okay, I made a mistake. Mm. Let me get up. Let me dust it off. Let me learn and let me move forward. And too many people, they just, I, I see, at least in the people that I work with, they guilt and shame themselves like it's this noble, worthy thing. And I, I just believe like there's a time and a place to have that. But if you're living in it, man, you're living in the path. You're not even living in the present. You're not even like looking forward. You're still looking back. So, and then uh, and regarding the I am statements, <clears throat> if people really knew the power of how they see themselves, if they really knew the power of words and language, they would avoid any type of negative self-deprecate they would like like in, in our home can't is one of those words we like rarely use mm. and i was like we, that's not a word where you, you can say i won't or that's difficult but i'm not going to say things like i can't or i'm no good like the powerful positive self-talk is a big part in our home but also with our clients because whatever we talk about the most think about the most focus on the most that's who we become i think there's a very interesting phenomenon and culture. And, and I, and I think this exists because we get some sort of benefit from it. Maybe it's psychological. I, I don't know exactly know what it is, but we tend to make ourselves into martyrs, uh, and paint ourselves as victims. So I've even caught myself just over the past five months dealing with the fallout and the negative ramifications of my poor decisions around drinking to myself. I'm like, well, I deserve this bad thing that's happening, or I don't deserve some good thing that I would like to have. And then I manifest that, right? Like I actually engage in the behaviors that keep me from having the things I want or keep me attached to the things that I don't want. And, I, and it's very weird that I try to paint myself. Even I even know what's going on. I try to paint myself as a martyr or a victim of my past circumstances. It's very strange that we do this. You know, I, I grew up in a it's kind of a similar way. At least I saw it in the culture where I grew up here. And- it's almost like this false humility, like you get points mm. for putting yourself down and as if there's this virtue in, you know, saying like, oh, I'm not that good or oh, that wasn't me. It was all God. I'm like, dude, just, how about you just accept the good that you're doing? Give credit to God when there's credit to be given to God, but you're the one who's doing the work. And and for me, I hate false humility, man. I just like people who can't take compliments, people who are unwilling to accept the good they're doing in the world, people who, who don't even see themselves as good enough, they're constantly deflecting. Again, one of my weaknesses growing up, one of the ways that I grew up, not from my parents, it's just the way that I had interpreted things and taken things on. So now I'm just like really trying to help my boys. I'm committed to helping my sons and our clients. Like, dude, it's our life. You want something? Go get it. Go do the required work. Go do what's necessary and necessary required actions and do it consistently every single day. And, you know, again, one of the, this conversation, I used to think that, oh, maybe God doesn't want me to be wealthy. I don't, I don't know if God wants me to be wealthy. And I had this weird thing about money, being humble, being a disciple. I, you know, I don't know if you, you had that, but I had it. And I struggled with it because I'm like, I wanted to be wealthy and have influence and make a difference. But I struggled as if like money was this, thing that was going to get in the way when I finally like got through all the meanings that I had made up you know, mm. from scripture and from church when I finally kind of broke through those it was so clear like whatever we want we can go get it and if the, you know I tell my boys don't God don't care what kind of job you have but just know this depending on the job you choose or the business you choose and the skills that you develop 
God can use you very differently, you know, and that's up to you. If you're okay not being used a certain way, you're a kind of a comfortable, they say, cool. But you know who your dad is. Like, we're going to go climb mountains. We're going to go charge. We're going to go build and develop and grow. And I want to be used as an instrument. I want to be a person who can impact, you know, in one of my favorite songs. I want to be the Lord's feet and the Lord's mouth and the Lord's hands and do the Lord's work. So, yeah, man. How did you how did you begin to overcome this conflicting thought about money? I'm glad you brought that up because that's a that's a real issue. That's something I've dealt with. Uh, that's something a lot of people deal with. And then we hear things like, you know, the, the misinterpreted scripture, which is money is the root of all evil, uh, or you, it's harder for a rich man to enter heaven than it is a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. These kind of things yeah. that we adopt into our, our psyche, our way of living. And then, yeah, of course, we're going to subconsciously sabotage ourselves because we want to be righteous people. I think most people do. Now, I had a mentor. So, you know, more come out of the NFL, start to kill it in the mortgage industry, 04, 05, 06, 07. Just, just great time, you know, if you were back in those days. Yeah. And then 08 hits. So 08, 09, 10, and 11, like three and a half years, almost four years of just, I was broke. I was bankrupt. I stole my Super Bowl ring. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I was like, my mind really got twisted. Like maybe God doesn't want me to. So it's 2012. I go knock doors in 2011, door to door sales. Do have a great year. Go do it again in 2012. And, you know, 2012, I'm sitting at my mentor's house. He's big home, brand new car, just doing so well financially. And I'm struggling with this dilemma. I've got all this money in my bank account and I'm struggling. I got this turmoil because in my heart, my desire, my desires are I want to succeed. And not to go have storehouses of stuff that I'm never, you know, I love to help people. I love to give back. I love to support family, my parents, nieces and nephews, give to charities. I just, it is, that's a great thing. So I'm sitting with my mentor and I'm like, man, I'm struggling. I've read all these books and I asked him, like, how do you deal with it? And he goes, tell me, here it is. Here's my beliefs. I'm like, okay, I pull my phone. I'm going to take notes. He goes, I believe that God doesn't have a thing about us having money. I'm like, okay. He's like, if you want it, Go get it. I'm like, that's it. He's like, that's it. Do good with it, right? The, the purpose of living is giving. And the more money you make, give it away. I mean, you keep making more money, you keep giving it away. And it's just this incredible cycle. And that conversation, Ryan, I took that. It was it was like, boom, it shattered everything. Because I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to take that one for me. If I want something, I'm going to go get it. And if God directs me somewhere else, it's almost all, always, no, not even almost, it's always towards something greater. And so now as a man, as, you know, provide, I love it because there's no more limits. There's no government, right? There's no, there's no stealing. If I want something, just go sow the seeds, reap the results, make, you know, be free to choose and be okay with it. And, so many people struggle with these financial paradigms. I'm like, oh man, I like the adversaries got you. Because if you don't have resources or you haven't developed yourself and you don't have influence and you can't be a critical thinker and you can't create, and you're like a slave. Like you're just this pawn in the game. And so I'm always, that's why I show my boys our, my bank account and I show them what we're doing and I show them. And I think a lot of it just kind of goes over them like, oh, that's cool. But I want them to know like, whatever you want. Whatever you want, whether it's in arts or sports, money, your body, your marriage, your purpose to God, you can have it if you'll just go pay the price for it. And that's the most simple way around money. And it, it has served me, you know, it's been 10 years, over 10 years since I had that conversation. We have been so blessed. We've worked hard and I love what we're doing, man. I, I'm really interested in your perspective on commitment because you talk a lot, you use that word a lot and you talk a lot yeah. about commitment. And I, and I think a lot of people who are listening to this will, will say they're committed, uh, will, will quote unquote be committed until it gets hard. <laughs> and that's not really commitment. Was it? Uh, and, and I'd love to hear you talk about what it actually yeah. means to be committed and how a person can be fully vested into something, whether it's, their business or their marriage or the relationship with their kids and actually be completely committed to it. 
So commitment for us, it is, man, I get emotional, man. Like commitment is, is the fuel. And we have a definition in, in our curriculum there. We have specialized terms and they're specialized meaning. So commitment is one of our principles, right? Commitment alters everything. And there's a three-tier definition. To be committed means you'll do what is required. You don't do your best. You don't do all that you know. You know, like I'd say doing your best is for kids, but doing what's required is for adults. Number two, being committed means you do what you say you're going to do. So if you say you're going to do something, it's like done. Like your word has to become bond. And there's a, this beautiful phenomenon. I mean, I always bring up the, I love the Old Testament. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And, it, and, and in the beginning, the word was God good. And it, it was by his word. Like light didn't like hang out. It was like, let there be light. Boom. By the power of his word. So when, when a man or a woman is committed, he or she will do what's required They'll do what they say they're going to do. And the third definition is they act decisively in spite of thoughts, feelings, emotions, and moods. Mm. Right? You're going to take decisive action. It doesn't matter if you're not in the mood, if you don't feel like it, if, if my emotions are if I'm depressed or tired. I'm like, you just take decisive action because once you start moving, you get momentum. And you know, in, the, in the land of commitments, tell people, if you want to know what you're really committed to, just go open up your bank account. Go take your clothes off, stand butt naked in front of the mirror. Go assess your marriage. Go look at look at your body. Look at your marriage. There, the results always reveal the prior path commitment. If you want a new result, get really clear about what that is, why it matters, and then commit wholeheartedly to every necessary required action. And again, for us, being committed is like, People don't get it. You know, we talk about the NFL. I'm like, it's hard to get to the NFL. It is freaking hard, man, to get to the league. It's hard to win us to get into the playoffs. It's hard to win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I was, I was committed. And we, I was part of the Patriots. And we won, you know, we got the first Super Bowl that ticked off the dynasty back in 2001, 2002. I'm committed to my body. I'm committed to having muscle on my body. I'm committed to having a bank account that's full. I'm committed to my beautiful goddess my sons and committed to my team I'm committed to my parents so you know it's like being committed is really a way of living and there's things that i'm not committed to i'm not committed to doing an, an iron man i'm not going to do it i don't want to do that i don't i don't want to go try i'm not committed to, to having six pack right now i'm not dude i'm not committed i'm okay i'm not committed to, to having certain things because i want them and if you'll actually get clear and commit like really commit it's an every single day phenomenon like every single day every day i wake up my wedding ring goes on and i'm like i'm committed to my wife i go to the gym because i'm committed to having a weaponized powerful vessel temple body i'm committed to being sharp so i commit which means i'm going to do what's required i'm going to do the things i say i'm going to do and i'm going to take decisive action regardless of how i my thoughts feelings emotions and moves and now i'm a committed people like you're committed bro you know why you just look at your results. Look at the fruits. You are committed. And it's a beautiful thing. Committed people, like game recognize game. Commitment recognizes commitment. And I think where a lot of people get stuck too is if you're like really what I call highly committed or sincerely committed, people who aren't committed, they will look at us and be like, those guys are crazy. They're obsessed. They're like too much. I'm like, no, we just know what we want. And we're not going to let life pass us by. Yeah, that, that, that's really powerful. Um, I love that you're talking about the weight that we give to our feelings or the way we feel about something in the moment. Cause we tend to do that. You know, I, I, when I was talking about that alcoholism earlier, I had made, I had, I had made this post on Instagram and I was like, I'm going to post this. I'm going to tell people, I'm going to try to get back in integrity. I'm going to post this. And I was sitting on the submit button for like five minutes, literally five minutes shaking. My hands were shaking. And I didn't want to do that, but I did because I was committed to getting back in integrity. And I felt like, hey, I don't feel like doing this. I don't want to do this. There's going to be fallout. There's going to be a backlash. And then I realized, you know what? None of that matters. Like that, that's not the reason you would or would not do something. If I'm committed to being in integrity, then I have to do this. And so I hit submit. Um, 
And yeah, that was, that was a hard decision to make. But the other thing that, that comes to mind when you're saying this is that sometimes we fall out of those commitments and we recommit. But I think a lot of guys and myself included tend to believe that that gets to absolve us of the consequences of our lack of commitment before. <laughs> right. So we have yeah. to deal with the fallout and the ramifications of our lack of commitment to the things that we said were important before. And that is very, very difficult. You know, and, and if you are a man of integrity or a woman of integrity, and like you have results or outcomes or targets or goals and things you're really striving for or a way of being that you're trying to become and you, and you don't hit it, like I tell guys, look, man, like clean it up. You know, clean it and like what do you mean like when you when you don't keep commitments it makes a mess like those ramifications and consequences there's there's consequences if if you know tell my boys, if daddy doesn't go to work and daddy doesn't create value for people there's a consequence and i gotta clean things up with my wife or with my kids or with my clients if i'm late on my word or i don't come through when i say i'm going to come through because i'm i'm big on that and and keeping my word i want and my dad and my mom they're like son you you, you get one name so make sure you represent and I, this is extant. Like just represent our family well. Like make us proud. And I know there's some people who are like, yeah, forget about making your parents proud. It it drives me. Like it really drives me to make my wife being proud to make my sons like that's our dad, that's our husband. It also makes me happy to to make my mom and dad. It, I'm almost fifty years old, and I still want to make my parents proud because I'm named after my dad, right, September Junior. And so living this life of like being really committed, just, and I'm like, if you're committed to everything, you're committed to nothing. Like yeah. you can't, you don't just commit to everything. I, I'm committed to a number of things that I know it's going to require everything I have. So when people ask me to do with you, I'm like, look, I, I'm unable to commit to that. I've already got prior commitments. And I'm, you know, it's like the more you, the more things you say no to makes it easier to say yes. And everything you say yes to, you're saying no to something else. So I'm very committed. I know what I'm committed to and who I'm committed to becoming. And I'm just really proud about my team, our clients, and my, my, my family for helping me with my commitments. I think this is where the language comes into play when you're talking about not doing things, not committing to things. A lot of people will say, well, I can't do that. No, actually, you can. You can do that. You're choosing not to. Correct. So I try to deliver, like when I tell somebody no, I, I'm not great at this all the time, but I do try to say, no, I'm not going to commit to that or no, I won't do that. But I don't ever say, at least I try not to say, I can't do I that. I can't. Correct. Because yeah, I can. The same way. Yeah. I can. If I, if I say no to this, then I can. So again, the language thing, I'm, I'm right with you. I'm like, I almost even said I can't do that, but I still have to catch myself. No, I'm unable to commit to that. I won't commit to that. I have previous commitments that matter so much, but thank you. Thank you for asking me. And right. it is a powerful way to live, man. And, you know, when people know they can count on you, so that's something I teach my boys too. I'm like, be the person people can count on. Like if when someone knows they can count on you, man, you have currency that is way greater than money. Because when people trust you, they'll, they'll give you, they'll open things up for you. They'll help you. They'll bend over backwards. And so, I'm you know, I'm not perfect in this rhyme, but I strive to be a man who people can count on. Like September said he's gonna do it, it's done. Like consider it done. Like September's gonna come through because he said it. And we just know that's who September is. So that's one of the things I strive for in my life. One of the things I'm I'm fairly good at is following through on the big things. You know, when I say I'm gonna do something, it's a big thing, something I interpret as being a big thing. Got it all day long. One of the things I struggle with. <laughs> is when I say I'm going to take out the trash, you know, tomorrow morning or tonight or whatever, the little things, the little things are what get me. It's the big things are easy for me to commit to. I'm like, cool. I got this big event. I got to plan this, do this, do that, X, X, X. But it's the, it's the little things on a daily basis, like taking out the trash or make the bed or make this phone call or drop this thing off to somebody. Those are the things I get tripped up over. I'm, I'm with you. I think that's pretty natural for most human beings. Um, when it comes to like the gym or to the event, we have a merge and or I got to meet a client. I'm like, yes. And I've learned over the years that I, I want to be perfect with my wife and my sons. So I'm very, very careful, cautious, very wise when it comes to making commitments to them. If I tell my wife 
or especially my sons, because you know, kids don't forget. You tell them something, they're like, Dad, you said we we're gonna do this. I'm like, right. there were instances in California where it'd be like 10 at night, it's pitch black, and, and they'd come to them like, Dad, you, you said we we're gonna go get ice cream. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I did. And so we're like, I've had to go ride bikes at 10 at night, go get ice cream 10 at night, because I'm like, I said it and those little things, man, just like being smart about like, am I really gonna do this? And I, I, very similar to you, Ryan. I'm I strive hard to be a man of my word, and it's it's such a powerful way to live when we can be a man or a woman of our word and power. Man, that's real power. Yeah, the one that gets me is I'll I'll do that later. So my <laughs> my my youngest son will be like, Hey, um, hey, Dad, uh, can we do Legos? And I say, Well, I have a meeting right now. I'll do it later. That's that's a mistake. I should never say that unless I, the only exception to that would be, Hey, I'm not going to do that right now because I have a meeting, but at three o'clock, my meeting's over and at three we're doing it. But if I just say we're doing it later, I know I'm just kicking the can down the road and I've had to purge that from my vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, same thing here. I, I'm, they're like, it's, what's on your calendar dad? <laughs> my, my boys know if it's on the calendar, it's like the law. So we schedule lunches, we schedule movies, we we schedule so much and it makes a big difference. Like being able to calendar, I, I'm like you, like in, in our home later doesn't work and maybe mm -hmm. we don't, that's erased. Like we don't do maybes, we do yeses and nos. And then we, we do calendar, like time, specific time. And being a, a parent true to your word with your kids, like, you know, I, I, can't, I know I keep talking about my kids, but that's like, that's the training ground for me. Training clients, I love my clients. It's easy. We're all adults, but my kids see the real me 24-7. Like the most tired, exhausted, spent, excited. So being able to be like my word to them, ah, oh, big difference, man. It makes me so happy. Yeah. That is a good way to say it. your kids see the real you. They know the real you. And isn't it weird that the people that we care about most, and I, I'd be willing to bet, I, I can speak for you, I think, on this, is that you care more about your kids. Their priority is a little higher on the list than even clients would be, right? Like, we can agree on that. And yet, those are the people that we let down the most. Like, we'll let them <sighs> down before we'll let a client down. I don't understand that. I do it. I don't it, understand why we do it. It's crazy because it's all like subconsciously we know my family's going to be here. Mm -hmm. like I, we, we we know subconsciously our family's not going anywhere. So for September, like I just was trained, taught, and educated, not by anyone, but that's how I trained, taught, and educated myself. I could keep my word to clients, keep my word to people in community, sports, church, but then my family would get the worst of me and, and something shifted in me where I was like assessing like the way I do my goals as I look back at the previous year. I'm like, okay, what didn't work this year? What What did I not like? What was something that gave me pain that I don't want to repeat? And one of those is my family gets the best of September now. Because I'd get home. I'd be like on point for an event. I'd be on point for calls. I'd get home and I'd just be so tired. And my boys, let's go play Galax. And I'm like, I'm so, I'm so. And they're like, okay, that's cool, Dan. All right. Wait, wait, wait a minute. This doesn't work. Giving my family the leftovers? No. So now it's like my family, one of my kinds of self creations is my family gets the best of September. They get the best of daddy. They get the best of so husband. They get the best of me, not the leftovers. And uh, it's been a great change for me. And it's, it's no, it's like normal for most of us because we want to impress people, but we just know our family's going to be there. And once you shift that, like, nah, my family gets the best of me, but they don't get, the, they, they don't get leftovers. They get the best of me. It, it makes such a big difference in the home. I love it, man. I've also noticed it makes us way more efficient in other aspects of our lives, right? If, if we dedicate that time, like whatever we carve out of our resources, time, energy, attention, money, and we dedicate it to something and then the rest gets the leftovers, whatever's left over has to be hyper efficient. You have to maximize that time or that resource because it's scarce. Like you don't have as much of it left. So you got to give the lion's share to what's important, your priority. Yeah, and again, you know, I, I break my day up into four quarters, like 5 a.m. till 9 is first quarter, and 9 to 1 is second quarter, 1 to 5 is third quarter, and 5 till, till sleep time is fourth. And I'm like, okay, I got to go win my quarters. First quarter is me. That's my quarter that prepares me. Second, third quarter, work. 
I'm telling the third and the fourth quarter's family. And again, through meditation, you know, just my, the things that I do, I'm able to reset through the day and I'm able to reset before I get home. And there's days where I'm, if I finish up with my stuff by three o'clock or two, two o'clock and my list is done, I'm like, I'm out, I'm going. <laughs> like I, I could find endless things to do, but once I'm done, I'm done. And then I'm going to go get my wife and my kids the best of me. And again, we, we, you know, you said something that that's so true. Whatever's left over has to be so effective and so efficient because whatever we have left is left. It's the leftover. And I'm just learning, like, I, think I will never leave my family the leftovers because I've done that for too long, man. And then all of a sudden you blink and they're teenagers. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. So the best of me goes to my family. The best of me goes to my clients. And I'm able to really compartmentalize. And I just, I believe in like this harmony of life, right? Where it's like, dude, we are the authors. We're creating, right? We're creating the life. So if something's not going the way that I want it to go, I get to make changes. I get to adapt and adjust, or I get to delete it, get rid of it. But I don't ever want to settle and tolerate mediocrity or tolerate things that just don't work because we're not victims like we yeah. get to choose yeah that's it that's a great I, I think that's where a lot of guys are and that, that's where i am partly in my own life right now you know dealing with the consequences of poor choices to some degree and what's tempting it, it's tempting at times to be victimized oh, i do this because of that i do this because of my dad i do this because of this person i do this because of this behavior whatever and when I realized that when I do that, yeah, it feels pretty good because it's not my fault, right? So, well, something else, that's why it wasn't me. So it's something else's fault. But then I realize that actually limits my power and ability to do something about it. Because if it's something else's fault or somebody else's fault, then I need to wait for that circumstance to change. And that circumstance is completely outside of my control. So I need to wait and sit idly by while some other factor of my life decides to rain good fortune upon me. It's a little too uh, passive for me. Yeah, I, like I, I tell my sons this, like, and I don't like to use the word like it's our fault because I'm like, look, it's, it's our choice. Like you have a choice, son, and just accept 100% responsibility. Like just be responsible for everything. And even if there's, you know, something happened, that was outside of your control, just find a way to be responsible for as much as you can. And you'll always be fine. Cause the moment you shift any responsibility, like, well, it's not my fault. Like that, that we don't even, that's like forbidden. That's like, I'd rather have my boys mm -hmm. cuss than say that kind of stuff. Like, well, it's not my fault. And again, we're having to correct that. And I'm like, let's don't say that. Learn how to be the person who takes responsibility. Like that's on me. I, I could have done this different Dad. I could have done this different in my life. I could have woken up earlier and left earlier then I wouldn't blame traffic. I could have done my laundry earlier so I wouldn't be searching for clothes. And it's like getting out of that victim language. It's a powerful way for men like us to live. It's like, you know, I'm responsible. I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for my results. I'm responsible for my connection to God. I'm responsible for my marriage. I'm responsible for my family, my bank account, my body. I am 100% responsible. And, that, that works miracles for me, man. Yeah, I think it's the difference between the short game and the long game, right? If, if you're playing the short Amen. game, you want to you wanna pawn off as much as you can. Just pawn it off, pawn it off. Not my fault, not my responsibility, somebody else, something else. But if you're playing the long game, or at least you want to play a longer game, then I think we need to be able to accept more of that responsibility because it'll pan out long term. It won't short. It's going to hurt, actually, probably more <laughs> short term. Amen. It's spot on, brother. Long game, knowing how to play that long game. Short game is easy to blame other people, but it never you never win. You never win. You're never happy if you if you play that game. Yeah. Well, brother, I appreciate you. you. Like I said to begin with, you inspire me to be a better man. There's so much that I can do, so much room for improvement, and I really appreciate your motivation and inspiration to help me in my own personal life. Ryan, thank you, man. It's an honor. I, I'm grateful for the work that you do and uh, i love your books i love your podcast and thank you man. keep leading brother you're you're impacting a lot of people myself included so thank you again man 
Hey, tell the guys where to go to connect with you. I know you also have an event, I think, coming up fairly yep. soon, maybe in the springtime. So tell the guys where to go and how to connect with you. Yep. So if you go to my, right, if you go to setemangali.com, S-E-T-E-M-A-G-A-L-I.com, that's just right, my first and last name. Everything's there. And then we have an, an event called Pro Rev Live, P-R-O-R-E-V-L-I-V-E.com. It's very similar to our boot camps, but it's the content without the boot camp and the butt kicking and the, just the, you know, the sand and the ocean and the water. But I love what I do, man. Like I, I just, again, I am a, a liberator of leaders. And I am a catalyst for the committed and I love helping people. So go to setemangali.com and connect with me there. We have a podcast and more programs, but it is just, Ryan, I'm thankful, man. Like, thank you. It's such an honor to be on your podcast and to, to be a part of your community and to see the good you're doing. And you, you have inspired me. Like I, I watch him. Yeah, I, good. I love, I love what Ryan's doing there. And you said things that are just have stuck with me and um, I appreciate it, man. So keep up the great work, man. You know, I will. We're not stopping anytime soon. And I, and I, lo I love the idea and the unapologetic liberator of leaders. I like that. Cause that shows confidence, what you've earned my friend. Anyways, appreciate yeah. you. Thanks again. Thank you, brother.